thank you to Jeff and Sabrina for putting on a wonderful conference. Can we thank them? Thank you for all you do. Thanks for inviting me to come back. Um, I want to talk about cheese. Um, can foods be addicting? There were some researchers at the University of Michigan, and they brought together 384 people, and they said to them, which foods give you problems? And, and what they meant was, which foods do you have trouble cutting down with? Which ones cause you to lose control? And just even when you're full, you're still having more, and you just can't stop. Well, the number five food was ice cream. Number four was cookies. Number three was chips. Number two was chocolate. And number one was pizza. And I'm going to argue that it's not the olives. <laughs> and it's not the crust. It's something about that gooey cheese melting all over it and piling higher. And is this not true? When you talk to people who go on a plant-based diet, they say, you know, this is really great, except I really, really miss cheese. What is it about this? What's going on here? But you might love cheese, but it doesn't love you back. And I'd like to talk about that in this hour. It's fattening, it's addicting, and it causes lots and lots and lots of health problems, and people have really given it a pass. They've overlooked it. So what causes weight problems? You talk to other people about this, or you read a news article, and they will say it's soda. It's sugar. And soda and these are not health foods. But I'm going to put a question mark as to whether that's the reason for the obesity epidemic that we have been seeing. Because if you look at sweetener consumption over time, it went up a bit over time. And as of 1999, it started falling. Because people started buying bottled water instead of sodas to a large degree. And if you look at cheese, where has that gone? Up and up and up and up. So where, which direction is obesity going? It's following the cheese. Well, what would that be? If you, if you look at cheese consumption over time, in 1909, the Department of Agriculture started tracking what Americans eat. And in 1909, cheese was something Swiss people ate. We don't eat it in Peoria. Uh, the average American could not get through four pounds of cheese in a year. But what happened? In the 1960s and 70s and 80s, fast food chains came in. Pizza places came in. And so cheese became an ingredient in a lot of what people were eating from day to day. And by, by 2013, we were at 33 pounds of cheese every person, every year. I'm not eating any. Somebody else is eating 60. So I'm going to argue that it's fattening for several reasons. Number one, it's loaded with calories. And you probably know this already, but if you don't, this is my most important number. A gram of sugar. A gram is tiny. It's a 28th of an ounce. A gram of sugar has four calories. A gram of fat has nine calories. Well, the leanest beef is about 29% fat. Chicken, not much better, about 23. Fish vary, some are lower, some are higher. Um, but if you look at plant foods, they're pretty low in fat, which is why they're not very high in calories. So where is cheese? 70% fat. If it were any worse, it would be Vaseline. So, okay, there is Coke Zero, so you could actually have a soda without any calories at all. But is there Cheddar Zero? I don't think so. All right. So, secondly, fat in foods adds easily to your body fat. Here's what I mean. Let's say you ate a little bit too much bread. Would that go to body fat? Mm, not really, at least not at the beginning. The carbohydrate that's in bread breaks apart, and it goes into your bloodstream, and it powers your muscle activity. It powers your brain. It's the fuel that your body runs on. Let's say I overdo it. I eat a lot more. Let's say, I, let's say I'm an athlete, and I'm, I'm carbo-loading. I'm eating lots and lots of bread and pasta. Does it go to fat? No. The reason athletes eat it, so much of it, is because it goes into their muscles and is stored as glycogen, which are batteries that you need when you're active. Also in your liver, it's stored, glycogen is stored there too. Now, theoretically, you can build fat from carbohydrate. 
but even if you ate the entire loaf of bread and it was more than you needed and your, your glycogen stores were all filled, if you made fat from it, even that, to make bread into fat is hard for your body and it uses up about 25% or so of its calories just to try to make it. Now on the other hand, cheese can go very easily to fat because it's already fat. It doesn't really require much of any conversion. You eat it, it goes into your blood, stores as fat. Very simple. Okay? Number three, fat slows your metabolism. Here's what I mean. This is a muscle cell. And the reason I'm showing you a muscle cell is you hear people say, don't lose your muscle mass. Your, your muscles are your calorie burners. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, so inside your muscles are mitochondria. Do you remember the mitochondria from high school biology? Those are your calorie burners. You have a lot of them, but you also have little bits of fat. Now, doctors hate words like fat because it only has one syllable, so we'll call it intramyocellular lipid, but it's, it's fat inside your cell, and if you ate a little bit too much chicken fat or beef fat or Velveeta or fryer grease for that matter, the fat builds up inside your cell. When that happens, the cell says, fantastic, this is great, I've got some fat that I can store up, and if we happen to have a famine sometime, I'm sitting pretty, I got a lot of stored calories. Now, if the mitochondria burn it all up, it's gone. So, when fat comes into the cell, the body turns down the production of mitochondria to keep the fat and your metabolism slows down to preserve this fat richness that just came in. And that's the opposite of what you want. You say, wait a minute, I just ate too much. Why are you storing it? You've got to get rid of it. The body was programmed a long time ago when there were such things as famines. So if you ate a big fatty thing, your body says, I'll keep that. And as the years go by, people's, the, the metabolism you had when you were 12 it's just no longer there because the mitochondria have been disturbed. So, if I'm on a low-fat vegan diet, time goes in the opposite direction. Okay, number four, cheese does not have fiber. Now, fiber is the most boring word in this lecture, I apologize. Fiber is big stuff, though. Fiber is plant roughage. It has effectively no calories. And so when I eat high-fiber foods, it fills you up, makes you think you've eaten a lot of foods, but the fact is you haven't really eaten very much. So fiber tricks the brain into thinking you ate a huge amount of food. But Velveeta has no, it's not a plant, it has no fiber at all, so every last calorie in it you get, okay? So here's the fiber. Baked beans have five grams, broccoli and other vegetables another five in a cup. An apple has about four, orange is three, bananas, brown rice, four grams. But cheese, none. Yogurt, none. Milk, none. Meat, none. Animal products don't have fiber. Okay, very simple. And fifth, a lot of people are not aware of this. Cheese has a lot of sodium. It's one of the highest salt foods that there, that, that there are. And it adds water weight. And so you can build up a couple of pounds of this. Now, an orange has sodium about a milligram in a typical orange, an apple about two, a cup of brown rice, maybe 20 or so, a potato, 13 grams of, uh, milligrams of sodium in a typical potato. Potato chips have the sodium added and they're up at 330. One serving of cheddar is 350 and a serving of Edam is 500 and Velveeta weighs in at over 800 milligrams of sodium in just one single serving. Okay, so why is cheese fattening? It's high in calories, the fat adds to your body fat, it slows down your metabolism day by day, it doesn't have any fiber at all to control your appetite, and it adds a little extra, it has a lot of sodium, so you're carrying two or three extra pounds of water, just making your knuckles a little bit smoother and making you, making you feel heavier and bloated. Okay. Now, you've heard about the Adventist Health Study. Researchers have studied Seventh-day Adventists for years, because church teachings say, don't smoke, don't drink, avoid caffeine, don't eat meat. And almost all Adventists are very good at the first three. Um, they're non-smoking, non-drinking, health-conscious people, but some eat meat and some do not. And that sets up a perfect natural experiment that researchers can take advantage of. So the Adventist Health Study too 
brought in not quite 61,000 people. And they were all over 30, and they split them into five groups based on the diets that they normally followed. And they looked at everyone's body mass, and, are, are, body mass index. Are you familiar with that, BMI? It, it's just your weight, based on, but adjusted for how tall you are. And so a healthy BMI is below 25. So the band on the left, the red band there, those are non-vegetarians, or, or basically meat eaters. And their BMI was not below 25, it was 28.8. And the next group were people called semi-vegetarians, meaning they ate meat but only once a week or less. A little bit slimmer. The third group, the pesco-vegetarians, pesco meaning... Okay, all right, fish. They're not eating any meat except for fish. They're a little bit slimmer. And then the lacto-ovo-vegetarians, a little bit slimmer too. And then that fifth group, I always have to tell my patients that a vegan is not a person from the planet Vegas. Um, but they are not only a lot slimmer, but they're actually the only group smack in the middle of the healthy weight range. And so now, let's compare the lacto-ovo vegetarians and the vegans. Um, I am going to argue that cheese is one of the biggest contributors to the extra weight that we see with the lacto-ovos, and that difference is roughly 15 pounds. Make sense? Okay. So what the heck is cheese? Well, you start with milk. This is from uh, Widmer's uh, Cheese Factory in Teresa, Wisconsin. The milk comes in in the morning and they pour it in this big tub and then they add some bacteria. And that gives it that kind of funky smell um, because it's fermenting the sugars that are in the milk, the lactose sugar. Then they add rennet. And you know about rennet. This is the enzyme that is in the fourth stomach of a newborn calf uh, who is dead. And you remove the uh, rennet enzymes and plunk that in as well. Um, although, incidentally, um, that's, a, that's a rather expensive and cumbersome source, so almost all rennet now in most factories is, is a genetically modified uh, product that's used. But it, at uh, the traditional places like Widmer's, they pride themselves on still using the, the calf. So then it coagulates and they drain out all the whey, which is this mixture of water and lactose um, and some other things. And then they uh, start to squeeze out the extra water and then you're left with cheese. And you add some salt to the top and what you have done with this process is taken liquid milk and made it solid. That increases the calories, concentrates the protein, increases the cholesterol and fat, and greatly increases the sodium. So, why do I get hooked on this? Why do people love this stuff? Well, I'm going to argue it's three things. People like salty things. They like fatty things. And there's something called casomorphins in the cheese. I want to tell you about all this stuff. So, salt is added in quite liberal quantities as cheese is made. And that's to kill the bacteria, or, or stop the bacteria from continuing to ferment it into mush. So they throw a lot of salt in and that kind of makes everything stop and it adds a flavor that people like. The greasiness everybody is aware of when you're washing your hands after eating pizza, that, that uh, dairy fat is all over your fingers. And that's, I'm going to argue that people like the combination of fatty, salty. That's why we like french fries and potato chips. But casomorphins are interesting. They're, they are opiates. Have you heard of these? These are opiates. Uh, when I say opiates, I mean that they are in the same chemical class as heroin or morphine or Demerol or any kind of narcotic painkiller, but they form as the casein protein is broken down in digestion. A, a, a typical protein is a string of beads. You look at it under a powerful microscope, there's all these little amino acid molecules joined one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And you swallow this, and your digestive enzymes break it apart. And the individual beads go into your blood, and your body takes them, the amino acids, and makes new protein. Except dairy doesn't work that way. The casein molecule does give you some individual amino acids, but it also gives you these little strings. This, is the, this will not be on the test. Um, these little strings of four, five, seven amino acids. They are biologically active. They go from the digestive tract into the blood. They pass the blood-brain barrier. They attach to the very same brain receptors that heroin would attach to. 
What are they doing there? These are casomorphins, casein-derived morphine-like compounds. I am going to argue that they are there because nature does not want to leave anything to chance. Baby calf says, hey mom, I don't think I'm going to nurse today. I'm going to go off into the woods with my friends. Uh, I'll see you on Thursday. Or if a baby, a human baby, didn't like to nurse and turned away from the breast, that baby's not going to thrive. So when the body makes milk, it puts protein into it and water and some sugars in the form of lactose, some fat, some hormones, and a little bit of feel-good. Have you, have you ever looked at the, the face of a nursing baby? They are so intent, and then they collapse into this slumber. And we say, isn't the mother-infant bond a beautiful thing? You just drugged the kid. So, anyway, I am arguing that this is part of the biological substrate of the mother-infant bond. And, of course, nature said, don't worry, all mammals are weaned. You know, once, you're, once you no longer need breast milk and you can eat on your own, you're not going to have milk. Humans are so creative that we figured out you never have to be weaned. And you can get casomorphins all your life in enormous quantities. And that's what it's all about. Making sense? Okay. So this is morphoceptin. This uh, casomorphin has about one-tenth the uh, receptor binding power of pure morphine, meaning it goes to the brain, attaches, gives you a little bit of feel-good. I think I'll have some more of this. Okay? Now, what I have just told you is not secret. The dairy industry has known all about this, and they've done the research on it. And they want to take advantage of it. So, working with the U.S. government, the dairy industry has decided to get people hooked on cheese. I want to share with you some slides. These are not my slides. I got these from the freedom, through the Freedom of Information Act from the U.S. government. In the year 2000, the U.S. government, working with Dairy Management Inc., held something called the Cheese Forum. And they wanted to unleash an interesting plan. Can we trigger the crave? Here's what they mean. They decided you could call some people cheese cravers. And others were enhancers. The, the enhancers, that's a person who takes a little bit of cheese and puts it on your salad. We don't want you. A craver opens up the refrigerator door, breaks off a big chunk of cheese, and stuffs it in their mouth, and piles it all over their pizza, and that person can double or triple their cheese intake, depending on how you do your marketing. That's the group we want. And that's who the government... Again, these are not my slides. These are U.S. government slides. This is exactly what they decided to do. So what do we want our integrated marketing program to do? We want to trigger cheese craving. How do we do that? You don't go to every little ma and pa restaurant down the block and say, would you please feature cheese? If you could get it in front of people, they might get hooked on this. That would take forever. What the government did was very smart. Fast food chains make decisions from their central headquarters, and those decisions affect every community in America, what's available. So the U.S. government made a contract with Wendy's, which I can show you if you want to see it. And they marketed something called the Wendy's Cheddar Lovers Bacon Cheese Burger and as a government program. And it sold two and a quarter million pounds of cheese just during the promotional activity. This is good. Really easy, one contract, and I am selling cheese like crazy. So they then worked with Subway, which had two sandwiches that didn't include cheese. They fixed that. They worked with Pizza Hut to make the ultimate cheese pizza, which has an entire pound of cheese on one serving. Burger King, Taco Bell, they put a hat on you that says, ah, the power of cheese. And they would say, okay, when people go through the drive-thru, don't just say, welcome to Taco Bell. Say, would you like to try a quesadilla today? Use the power of suggestion at every opportunity and make sure the cheese is on every item on the menu. Now, I am going to argue... By the way, don't get paranoid. This is the way the government works. This is what they do. They are working with industry to promote American agricultural products, and the health consequences which flow from this are completely secondary in their mind. Okay, now I'm going to argue that just because something is fattening is not necessarily worrisome. Lard is fattening. I mean, it's got nine calories in every gram. It's very, very fattening, but who wants it? People don't eat a huge amount of lard. And I'm going to argue that if something is addicting, that's not necessarily a problem. Coffee is addicting. Tea is, it's, it's got caffeine, but 
You know, that's not necessarily good, but it's not going to make you weigh a million pounds. But if something is fattening and addicting, like cheese, now we're talking about a major contribution to obesity. Well, what about health problems? Let's talk about a few. Um, this is Catherine Lawrence. Some of you may know Catherine. Catherine is one of our Food for Life instructors, and I got to know Catherine because she, she grew up in Louisiana. She was an aerospace engineer working for the Air Force, and she went to Iraq, was one of the first people to go into Iraq because she designed military bases. And working over in Iraq, she was working very hard, eating the rations that they had available, and you don't gain weight that way. Uh, she came home after her tour of duty, and her friends all took her out to eat all the time, and she loved her Louisiana foods, especially cheese, Cheetos. In fact, one of her friends found out that she loves uh, macaroni, those macaroni and cheese boxes that college students live off of. She had a special thing for them, for, for them, so a friend of hers gave her an entire case, and for 48 days straight, she ate macaroni and cheese boxes. Well, Catherine said, you know, there's something wrong with me. She started gaining weight, and she developed a condition called endometriosis. Is that a familiar word? What, what, it, your, your stomach hurts, and it especially goes with your period, with, with your, your menstrual cycle. And what's, what's happening is the cells from the lining of the uterus have sneaked out and are elsewhere in the abdomen, and they're swelling and contracting and swelling and, and contracting, and they cause terrible pain, and it can lead to infertility. And as it was getting worse and worse and worse, her doctor said, Catherine, I know you wanted to have kids. You're not going to have kids. You, I, I got one treatment for you. You need surgery, you need a hysterectomy. Well, hold that thought. A friend of hers said, you know dairy's got hormones in it, and why don't you, why don't you try a plant-based diet? Here's, here's the science of it. A cow does not give milk unless the cow has been pregnant. And like all mammals, they, they're, they're pregnant, they give birth, and, they, and the milk comes out. Okay, so as the pregnancy proceeds, hormones are produced in the the body of the cow, and you can measure them in the blood plasma. It goes up, and these hormones end up in the milk. There they go. And most of the milk that anybody ever drinks, or that is on the shelves of any grocery store in America, most of it comes from pregnant cows, because they're pregnant, impregnated annually. They're kept pregnant. And they have a lot of estrogen in them um, that's a match for your estrogen. And it, it, does this affect you? Would, would this affect a woman? Well, I don't know. But researchers have looked into this, and what they found is interesting. Uh, some Australian researchers in 2010 brought in a group of women who were postmenopausal, meaning shouldn't be having a lot of estrogen in your blood no matter what. And they put them into four groups depending on how much dairy they ate. And the group on the left was the people who were the dairy avoiders. And the other three bars are the people who have, had, had dairy as a regular part of their life. And what seems to really make the difference is, do you have it or do you not have it? Once people are having a substantial amount, they tend to have a lot of estradiol in their blood. Men, don't go to sleep. Researchers at Rochester, New York, went into a fertility clinic. And they interviewed men and said, are you a low cheese eater? half a serving a day, no more than that? Or are you a big cheese eater, like a serving, two and a half servings a day? And they looked at their sperm counts, and the people who tended to avoid cheese had better sperm counts. The people who were big cheese folks had pretty low sperm counts. Now, is that because there are female hormones from the milk because the cows are pregnant, and so you're getting estradiol with every glass of milk? I don't know. But Catherine said, let me give this a try. She went totally vegan, and she went back to the doctor. The doctor did another laparoscopy, and he looked around in her abdomen, and he looked, and he looked, and he looked, and he stopped. And the, uh, she, she, the procedure was over. The doctor walked out to the waiting room and said to her husband, this is a miracle. Her endometriosis is, for all intents and purposes, gone. And the, her husband said, 
Well, you know, it's amazing. I didn't really think the diet would work, but she's felt better and better and better, and, and it's, it's amazing. And the doctor said, no, there is no way that diet could do that. This is a miracle. <laughs> Medical science works in wonderful ways. She lost weight. Her endometriosis disappeared. She's got two kids. Um, and she's uh, now one of our Food for Life instructors. She goes around sharing her story and letting other people know that it's worth seeing if asparagus can help. Okay, so there's Catherine today. Uh, this is Mark Ramirez uh, from Detroit. Mark grew up in Texas, and he was recruited to the University of Michigan to play football. And if you weigh 300 pounds, that's a pretty good thing if your job is to tear a hole in the defensive line. However, um, after his athletic career ended, he was unable to shake the weight. And he laid into cheese and meat in a pretty big way. He gained a lot of weight. He developed diabetes. His blood pressure went up. And he had erectile dysfunction, which a lot of guys have. And as, as you know, uh, or maybe you don't know, erectile dysfunction is not caused by performance anxiety. <laughs> erectile dysfunction is a sign of narrowing arteries. In the same way as narrowed arteries can affect the heart or the brain, they affect any part of a man's body. And all that Viagra does is take those arteries that have been narrowed by years of a bad diet and try to open them up a little bit more. That's all it does. And so anyway, these are the problems that Mark had. And he was on a lot of medications. And I want to walk you through where the diabetes comes from. Because th this is the same cell I showed you earlier. But you have, if you have diabetes, you have glucose, sugar, in your blood, which is trying to get into the cell to give energy to the cell. That's what glucose is for. And the problem in diabetes is instead of getting into the cell, the glucose is building up in the bloodstream and you, you measure it. If it would get into the cell, everything would be fine. To get the glucose into the cell, you need insulin. Insulin is like a key. It's a hormone made in the pancreas and goes into the blood and, and it arrives like these little keys to the surface of the cell and attaches to that red receptor and once it does, just like, just like a, a key in a lock, it causes these channels to open up and there they go. There's the glucose coming into the cell. That's what's supposed to happen and if you, di if you have diabetes, if you have type 2, you've got glucose, you've got insulin, you've got receptors, you've got everything. But you've also got intramyocellular lipid, fat building up inside the cell, and that causes the signaling not to work. It's like when I was a kid growing up in North Dakota, we had some of the neighbor kids would play a trick. You're not home, and they sneak up to your front door, and they put a tiny bit of chewing gum in your front door lock, and then they run and hide behind a bush. And you get home, and you take your key, and you put it in the... You put your key in, put your key in the lock, and it doesn't work. And you look at the key and it's fine, but you're either condemned to walking in and out your window for the rest of your life or calling somebody to clean the key out. It's a practical joke. Anyway, you don't have gum inside your cells. What you have is fat. And typical diabetes treatments ignore that. They don't deal with that fact. But on a plant-based diet, when you get the fat out of your diet, the fat starts to diminish inside the cells. That causes the signaling to be able to work again. And if you can get that signaling working, the diabetes can improve and in some cases go away. And that's what happened to Mark. Mark got better and better and better and better. And finally his doctor said, Mark, I don't know what you're doing. Your blood sugar is too low to need any medication. And at some point they erased the diabetes uh, diagnosis. It's all gone. And he's, he's stuck with it and years have gone by and he's slim and he doesn't have diabetes or any of these health problems anymore. Okay, let's talk about asthma. Um, this is Chad from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. He lived right on the water with his brother and his family. And Chad was a very active kid. He loved sports, but he could not get through a baseball game because asthma would kick in after the exercise or all the pollen that he was uh, breathing in. And he had every kind of allergy. He was allergic to dust and all kinds of envir environmental things and animals. If he would go to a friend's house, he couldn't handle the dogs and the cats. And somebody, when he was about 18, said, hey, could it be dairy products? Why, why, don't, you, why don't you get away from dairy and just see? And he did. He tried it. And within about three months, not only was his asthma completely gone, but so were his allergies. And what's this about? Somehow, 
get, avoiding these antigens from dairy made his body react in a different way. So scientists have, have looked into this question. Could dairy products actually contribute to asthma? And if you go on Google and you type in asthma dairy, and the very first thing that comes up in your search is from the National Asthma Council of Australia, which has very helpfully gone straight in and answered this question for us. Dairy foods have often been suggested as a common trigger for asthma. But there's little scientific evidence to support this myth. And unfortunately, most Australians are missing out on the health benefits that come from consuming milk, cheese, and yogurt as they don't include enough dairy foods in their diet. Wait a minute. This is starting to smell a little bit funny, isn't it? So I'm going to click on this website and see who sponsors them. And Dairy Australia is one of six sponsors, and the other five are drug companies. One makes money if you buy the cheese, and the others make money if you stay sick. So I looked at the report that they had quoted. They, they gave references to the studies that supposedly show that it doesn't work. And they weren't very big studies, but I looked at one. One was from New York University in 1991. Had 11 adults, they all had asthma, and they drank either whole milk, skim milk, or water. And what they showed is if they drank whole milk, their ability to have uh, gases pass through their lungs got progressively worse from the milk. And they thought it had to do perhaps with the fatty milk. So cheese would even be worse. Then there was a UK study from the United Kingdom. It was kids. They were between 3 and 14 years of age. And they gave them a milk and egg-free diet for eight weeks. And, and the way you test this, if, if, if you know anybody who has asthma, if you have it yourself, you try to see if the kid can breathe out, if they can have good expiratory flow, because that's what tends to go bad. And what they showed is that if they went egg and dairy free, their ability to breathe out was much, much, much better. It really helped them clear up. Now, this was a study that went over eight weeks, and it just so happened that Easter was in the middle of that period. So they went to the chocolate factory and said, OK, do you have non-dairy bunnies for us? Which they did. And these kids got a lot better. Bottom line is I couldn't find evidence that set this aside. People haven't really looked at it very much at all because no one's making money if you stop consuming milk. But all the evidence I have seen and lots and lots of individual cases have suggested probably worth trying. So there's Chad. Chad's allergy-free, asthma-free. He's got a dog now. <laughs> He's not allergic to his dog or anybody else's, and he's, and he's been working with Ruby Cooking School, which some of you know, they have a, a terrific program called Culinary Rx, where doctors can say, let's, let's guide you into using, the, using this uh, nutritional technique to see if you can't get better. Uh, migraine headaches. A lot of people have migraine headaches, unfortunately. This is Lauren. Lauren was an attorney. She was uh, 23 years old, and in law school, one day, her vision started to narrow, and she got this intense sledgehammer on half of her head, and she was sick, nauseated and vomiting. And she was not surprised, because she had a family member who had exactly the same symptoms, and this is a migraine. The word comes from hemicrania, a Greek word that means half your brain, half your head, uh, because it's often a one-sided headache, uh, very severe long-lasting, if you uh, move or if you're um, in a, uh, too much light or too much sound, it, it just drives you crazy. And this can last overnight, it can last for a couple of days, and it interferes with everything you're trying to do. And everybody who has uh, migraines has heard about these trigger foods. Um, aged cheeses, sausage, fermented foods, and what they are telling you, as every website on asthma will say, is that these foods have tyrosine, which converts to tyramine, and that tightens up your brain. True. However, we have seen a lot of people have migraines that are triggered by other things, too. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that. And at the Hospital for Sick Children in London, back in 1983, they started exploring this. They brought in a group of kids, 88 kids, and they put them on an elimination diet, not just eliminating dairy, but other common allergens. And 78 of the kids were completely headache-free. And four had a partial improvement, so this is good. Now, in adults, I don't see quite that degree of success, but we do see it uh, up to about 50%. And there are a number of triggers other than dairy that, that sometimes can 
be implicated. But I think dairy seems to be the most commonly reported one. And if you're dealing with migraines and can't function and are stuck on medications day after day, it's really, really, really worth it to get the dairy out of your diet and see how you do. So Lauren's got no, migra no, no migraines anymore. All right, let's talk about rheumatoid arthritis. If you look into your joints, if you've got arthritis, the joints are inflamed. The, 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 the synovial lining is looking ugly. It's inflamed. It's inflamed because it is being attacked by the immune system, which has been alerted by some protein that got into your body. That's how the immune system works. A virus comes in, you, 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 the, the proteins on the virus trigger an immune response. This may not be a virus. It's some other kind of protein that got into you. And what proteins do people get? Well, dairy proteins are one of the ones that people are sensitive to. So researchers have looked into this, and starting with an individual case report back in 1985, it was one girl. She had terrible juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and a doctor said, a thoughtful doctor said, get away from dairy, this could be it. Symptoms completely remitted. And then she went and visited grandma, who would give her milk chocolate candy. And her symptoms came back. And she got off it, and the symptoms went away. And then uh, a pediatrician said, this can't be true. You should have milk for calcium. Her symptoms came back. And they went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and the pattern became inescapable. So they published the uh, findings in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, saying, here's one case. Maybe other people have diet-induced uh, arthritis. And so triggers have been identified, not in everybody, but somewhere between 20 and 60 percent of people in research studies. And in Oslo, Norway, researchers brought in a group of people and started them on a juice fast, and then a vegan diet, and then a lacto-vegetarian diet. But within the very first month, they found clear-cut symptomatic improvement and reduction in, in biomarkers as well. Uh, less pain, less tenderness, less swelling. And then John McDougall in Santa Rosa used a vegan, just a vegan low-fat diet and found that within a four-week time frame, you saw uh, improvements, particularly in people who are relatively new to having rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Prostate cancer is one of the most common forms of cancer that we have, obviously. And for many, many years, researchers have said, this is something, that it goes with milk. That the countries that have the highest milk consumption, that's on the, on the right-hand side, they've got the most prostate cancer. Well, at Harvard, the Physician's Health Study said, in our group of 21,000 physicians, it's true. Two and a half servings of dairy products a day, every day, increases your risk of prostate cancer, about 34%. They did another study called the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study. Same thing. The more milk, the more prostate cancer. In this case, 60%. So what we believe is happening is that the hormonal effects from the milk trigger either the initiation of cancer or more likely the aggressive growth of cancers that happen to form. So rather than having those cancer cells die, they grow and they promote, their, their spread is promoted. Now, this is Chicago. In the Chicago Health and Aging Project, researchers looked at what might be the scariest disease of all. They brought in hundreds of men and women and asked them what they ate. And then as the years went by, they looked to see who developed Alzheimer's disease. And the very first foods that they keyed in on were things I knew all about as a kid growing up in North Dakota. Uh, my mom had five kids, and we would come down to the kitchen. My mother took a fork and she put the bacon on, out of the pan into these paper towels to cool down. And then when, the, when there was no more bacon in the pan, she would carefully lift, lift that hot pan and pour the grease into a jar. Did your mom do that? She, she was going to save it. And she didn't put the jar in the refrigerator. She just put it on the shelf because when bacon grease cools down, what happens to it? It hardens, it solidifies, and that's a sign that it's loaded with saturated fat, bad fat, the fat that raises your cholesterol. And then, of course, the next day she would spoon it back into the frying pan to fry eggs in it. Uh, it's amazing any of her children lived to adulthood, but that's what we did. So, but, but the number one source is not bacon, the number one source is dairy products. And meat is number two. And some people in Chicago eat relatively little saturated fat, around 13 grams a day. Some people eat a lot, 25 grams a day. And the researchers then said, OK, are these groups the same with regard to whether they get Alzheimer's disease? And here's the numbers. 
There's the people eating relatively little saturated fat, their Alzheimer's risk. There's the people eating a lot. They did it again, using now looking at trans fat, the fats that are in snack foods. And what they showed is it's almost identical to heart disease. If you were eating the bad fat, you're at high risk. If you avoid it, you're at low risk. It's amazing. And what this shows us is those of us who have thought up until now that Alzheimer's is entirely genetic. Genes are in two categories. There are the dictator genes that give orders. You will have blue eyes. But the genes for Alzheimer's disease are more like committees. They make suggestions. You, you might get Alzheimer's disease, but it depends on your lifestyle. You might get diabetes. A lot of the disease genes are not dictators. It's not all or nothing. It depends in part on, on, on what you do, whether they express themselves. So cheese and other dairy products are by far the biggest source of saturated fat in the American diet. So even though people say get away from it, they don't go the next step and say, don't eat the dairy products, which is giving it to you. Okay, I'd like to shift and talk about some of the things that are not related directly to health, but that are huge motivators for a lot of, a lot of people. And if these are meaningful to you, I'd like to share, share with you some facts that you might not have thought about. Uh, when I go home to Fargo, which is where I grew up, uh, I snap these pictures. There's beautiful cornfields, as far as the eye can see. Identical plants, <laughs> genetically modified corn that no human is ever going to consume. That's for, those are, that's for cows and pigs and chickens. Um, and you cannot raise a hundred... Uh, Americans eat a million animals every hour. Um, you can't raise that much feed without fertilizer and irrigation and so forth. And if you're going to irrigate, uh, it uses up a lot of water. And here are the numbers. If you brush your teeth and leave the water running the whole time, you could run as much of a gallon as maybe a gallon of water. If you take a good luxurious shower, maybe 20 gallons, you wash your car, 65 gallons, but just to produce one gallon of milk, the feed grain that has to go into that cow to lead to that gallon of milk, uh, it requires irrigation of about 683 gallons, okay? And that's just to grow six pounds of alfalfa. No human's going to eat that. That's all for cows. Um, the fertilizer then that's been put on start, sort of trickles into the rivers and streams. Uh, the nitrogen and the phosphor, phosphorus goes down the river. That causes an algae overgrowth and other life forms are killed. And if you look at the very bottom of the Mississippi, where all that water comes down, below Louisiana and Texas, there is a dead zone that is as big as the state of New Jersey. And that's primarily because we're using fertilizers to grow things for animals to eat so that we can eat a little bit of food that you get from the animal, okay? Now, climate change, I don't need to tell you. This was controversial five years ago. It's no longer controversial. Everybody knows that belching cows produce methane. Uh, by the way, it's, it comes out this way, through their mouth. Their, their stomach is, is ruminating, making the methane, and they're just belching it out. And how much can they really make? Well, there are 100 million cows at any given time. And if you put all of them on the scale on this side, and all the human beings in the United States on this side, the cows way outweigh us. And they're producing methane kind of nonstop, um, as well as other greenhouse chemicals. And cows produce one more thing, too. Um, this is a dung beetle. And the reason I'm showing you a dung beetle is the dung beetle has found creative things to do with dung. Um, this is the Secretary of Agriculture. Um, and when, if you go to a typical dairy, um, a cow produces in a day maybe eight gallons of milk. And I'm going to use, not dung, but I'm going to use chocolate milk just as an example. Um, they produce about 15 gallons of manure. Uh, in other words, for every gallon of milk, they produce two gallons of manure. Where am I going to put that? Well, for the man who has everything, you can get a manure digester. And you will see these at every dairy, and you can also subscribe to Manure Manager magazine. Have you seen this? It's great, and they also have the Manure Expo. Um, this one was in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, but there's a whole world out there of people trying to figure out how to deal with manure and how to get rid of it and how to make money off of it. Um, ethical issues. There aren't any ethical issues with regard to dairy, because they don't kill the cows. 
right? The cows give you milk. Well, if you go online, um, you can get from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization your guide to small-scale dairy farming. So how you can do this at, uh, at home. And these are not my slides, these are UN slides with these very graphic um, illustrations. Um, how we are going to get milk. You have to first get semen, and they use what they call an artificial, I'm not making this up, um, this is not a Trump speech. If you take an artificial, <laughs> artificial vagina, is what they call it, and you ex extract semen from this bowl, and then you take your left hand and put it into the cow's rectum. A every glass of milk you ever drank, or anyone ever drank, came from this process. You take your left arm, stick it into the cow's rectum, through the rectal wall you can feel the uterus, then you take your right hand and pick up this knitting needle device that has the semen loaded into it, put it in through the cervix and shoot it, and then that will impregnate the cow at a moment that you then record in spray paint on the side of the cow. And nine months later she is going to, this is what it looks like, um, and nine months later she will give birth. However, if that calf is allowed to stick around with mom, that is going to defeat my industry because the calf is going to drink the milk and, the, and I can't sell it. So that calf goes into a wheelbarrow. And if he is a male, he's going to become veal very fast. If, he, if she is a female, I can use her. But I can't have her drink milk. I will give her a milk substitute and she will stay in this hutch until she is ready to be big and graze a little bit and then she will be impregnated too. They're chained by the neck so they have they can't say anything about whether they're impregnated or not, and they're impregnated every single year, and they, they produce milk until about four years of age, at which point they're really just kind of past their prime, and if I kill you and replace you with a younger cow, I get more milk per unit feed. So, although uh, the, lifestyle, the lifespan of a cow is much longer than that, they're killed by about age four. Um, this was from the Newburyport, Massachusetts newspaper. Strange noises coming from the high road near Sunshine Dairy Farm Monday night and into yesterday morning prompted local police to alert residents that there's nothing spooky or scary going on. According to Newberry Police Sergeant Patty Fisher, the noises are coming from mother cows who are lamenting the separation from their calves. It happens every year at this time. And if you go to a dairy, you will see the, the cow who was impregnated nine months earlier is giving birth and she's licking her calf. And the calf is... is, is, is Cozing up to mom, and the farmer says, No, 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 no. And take. There's one simple trick to controlling your weight. Cardiologist Stephen. And the mother follows and tries to stop. And they have this fight, and then the farmer always wins. And the cows cry out every night after night after night after night, and, and people in the dairy industry all are aware of this, and they call it a reflex. But there is no greater bond in any species than the bond between a mother and the baby. Because if they were not bonded and didn't do everything that they could to nurture that baby, the species wouldn't survive. And the dairy industry requires that to be broken because otherwise you can't sell this product that you inseminated that cow to produce. This is your product, not theirs. Um, the females are then dehorned. The horns are cut off because they could hurt you. Um, it's a process called dehorning or disbudding if you get it early enough. They, they don't use anesthesia. Um, so of course they kill them. Uh, in, this was May 2015. Uh, they sent about 200,000 cows to slaughter that, uh, at that point. It's just all economics. Okay, am I cheering you up? Are there things that I can eat instead? <laughs> of course. It's so easy. I don't have to have that cheese, that pizza. They'll, they'll, they'll say that pizza. And of course, uh, the miracle, you do use nutritional yeast. You know, people eat it because it's got protein or whatever, but it happens to have this cheesy flavor that works great on a pizza or lasagna or whatever. And, and there are so many things that you can use to top a pizza. And there are a million ways to top a salad. It doesn't have to be cheese. And there are so many ways to make um, your lasagnas, all kinds of things. So instead of grilled cheese, hummus sandwiches, in Fargo, we never heard of hummus. But I'm kind of glad somebody showed me, how to, showed me about it because it's a very uh, handy thing. So there are so many ways that we can replace this product and feel better about it. Um, I've written a book on this called The Cheese Trap because I was so, uh, so taken by the fact that nobody knows any of this stuff and they're kind of hooked on this product and I am 
going to suggest that if we broke away from just this, that we'd go a long way toward co conquering a lot of the health problems that have been bothering us a little bit. The foods that we want to focus on are the fruits and grains and legumes and vegetables. And if we really focus on those, I do think that we can change things. Now, you're going to say to me, wait, 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 wait. You're a dreamer. People love this stuff. And they are hooked on it, as you said. Who's going to ever stop? And there's a huge industry that is out there to fight you because if you say there's a better option or vegan cheese, that's not going to work. They've got political clout and they've got the government on their side. Here's why we are winning. A generation ago, I was sitting in, a, my, in my hospital, the George Washington University Hospital, and we were debating the question, could we ban smoking in the hospital? Patients love to smoke. You know, they could, our, our patients could smoke in bed as long as oxygen wasn't flowing. <laughs> we sold cigarettes in the gift shop and I bought them. Oh I bought Merit menthols. I would light up on the way down to the doctor's lounge. My chief of surgery was with me. He bought Marlboros. And we would smoke in the hallway. And we weren't stupid. We knew that cigarettes caused cancer, but we also knew that we had time. It takes time. If I quit, eventually I'll be okay. So at some point we thought, wait a minute, time is up. We got to quit. In fact, we got to be good role models. Let's ban smoking from the hospital. But it was very controversial. There are big industries. There are, there's a lot of people who want this stuff. Can we do it? We made the decision. And within two weeks, we knew we were right. And everybody, every hospital did the same thing. In every restaurant, in every government building, in every other building, in every airline, they all made the same decision, and everybody knew that they were right, and this enormous political uh, force, the tobacco industry, started to diversify. And they started to have other products because they can see the writing on these are not stupid people, and they are not intentionally unethical people, at least not at the beginning. They got into growing tobacco because nobody knew when the tobacco industry first started that it caused lung cancer. But the industry is changing, and there's not a person on the planet who doesn't know. And in fact, it can be a cold February morning in Washington, D.C., and somebody in his shirt sleeves is finishing up the last puff on his cigarette outside before he's allowed into his non-smoking building. Well, that's where we are now with food. We know we got a problem. We know that if we could change our diet in, in various ways, we'd get a benefit. And we know that when we look at our kids, they're the most unhealthy generation we have ever had. But I don't know. Food's so good. There's big industries. You can't really fight them. Well, wait a minute. Time is up. Time is up. We have to make some changes. And the way to make these changes is not to waggle our finger and make people feel guilty. The way to change it is to inform people and get the information into people's hands, which is why I love what is happening here at VegSource, is we're getting information and exchanging it, and, and what works for you, and what recipes are the, are the ones that people like the best. And then you have fun with it. Chef AJ is a master at this. You can have fun with food, and fun with tastes, and there are kind of ridiculous things about food too, and there are some cool recipes, cool products, cool websites, cool books, and when you find these things, you share it around, and it's not deprivation, it's an adventure, and people feel liberated to find things that they didn't know that they can take advantage of. And I am convinced that one February morning, not too long from now, there will be a man shivering outside his building in Washington, D.C., having the last bite off his chicken wing before he's allowed into his vegan building. And that's the day I want to see come. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Have a great lunch. We'll see you in the next afternoon. Thank you.